Now, around the world, LGBTQ plus rights have been in decline over the past year. From America to Europe to Africa, new laws have been introduced targeting their safety. Kimali Powell is CEO of Rainbow Railroad, an organization that helps LGBTQ people fleeing persecution. And he's joining Hari Srinivasan to discuss the increasing risks facing that community. Christian, thanks. Kamali Powell, CEO of the Rainbow Railroad, thanks so much for joining us. So you put out an annual report, and in that report, you document that you received 10,000 requests for aid last year. Why do you think 2022 was the most number of requests you've ever had? Our work intersects between two disparate crises. One is that the UNHCR reports that there are 110 million people displaced uh, in 2023. That's the highest number of record. And at the same time, there are 67 countries that criminalize same-sex intimacy. And I think as we see globally a number of geopolitical crises and concerns, whether it is in Afghanistan or Ukraine um, or earthquakes in Syria, um, we know that LGBTQI plus persons are increasing at risk, which is why um, they reached out to organizations like Rainbow Railroad to help. So we recently had World Refugee Day. And tell me a little bit about kind of the compounded problem that it is to be a refugee fleeing your home, going into another country, and also being LGBTQ+. You know, the rules of the Refugee Convention mean that if you are fleeing a country based on war, um, famine, or any other issue, you need to flee your country of origin and go to a neighboring country and register with the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, but in the situation of Uganda, which I know is uh, top of mind, for example, situ uh, people in Uganda need to flee to neighboring Kenya. Uh, and both countries criminalize same-sex intimacy. So if you are LGBTQ+, and you are trying to seek protection, uh, for the first hurdle is crossing that land border and getting into the country. Um, it's certainly difficult if you're a woman or if you're trans. But even if you do get through that land border, then you're trying to register for a UN refugee agency or get protection in a country that also criminalizes same-sex intimacy and discriminates because of sexual orientation or gender identity. And so we've seen documented reports of violence, persecution, both in the country of origin where people are internally displaced or as they seek refugee protection. In Uganda, they already had some of the toughest anti-gay laws on the books. And this was a country that you were getting requests from already. But just recently, they passed a law that I think the phrase is aggravated homosexuality, and it would carry the death penalty. What has that done? Have you seen an impact on that already? I know that this report was based on stuff last year, but what's happening in Uganda? So one of the key reasons why we do this report is because there's very limited data on the persecution of LGBTQ plus persons, which is why we launched it on World Refugee Day. And last year, uh, Uganda was already amongst the top 10 countries of which we received requests for assistance. I, we were really nearly, you know, over 300 requests for assistance. Um, the good thing about our data is that we're able to track uh, data real time so that we can respond to crisis situations. In 2023, so far, we received double the amount of requests for assistance from Uganda. Uh, and the vast majority of those now over 600 requests for assistance have come since March when the anti-homosexuality law was passed in parliament. So the direct correlation with the further aggregation of um, these laws and the persecution of people. And now Uganda is amongst 12 nations that impose the death penalty on people just for who they are or who they love. So tell me, what are you able to do? What's your organization able to do? What are the partner organizations on the ground able to do for people who are reaching out for help? Absolutely. Rainbow Railroad has developed a model by which we work collectively with human rights defenders on the ground um, uh, to verify, identify people at risk. Uh, when we do that, we do that uh, people are able to reach out to us directly online uh, in multiple languages, but that we also rely on our partner networks to help us identify cases directly on the ground. Once we do that, we initiate travel uh, options when we can. Uh, sometimes there are very limited options. Uh, and we look at all the tools that we have at, at our disposal. Um, and then ultimately, we 
um, conduct travel and evacuations um, ourselves alongside the individual at risk. Often in those cases, we have to advocate for um, pathways to safety, calling on governments to work collectively with us, especially when there's a crisis situation, which we do so as well. Uh, and we're continually then looking at how we can uh, learn from our work to provide more support for people at risk. One of the things that I think is interesting in your report, when you look down at the list of top 10 countries of request, I mean, you go past Afghanistan and Pakistan and Turkey and you got it, but down at number eight, is the United States. Explain how the United States got on this list of people requesting assistance from organizations like yours. You know, uh, Harry, this is something that we're still unpacking as an organization, to be honest. Uh, but the data uh, really points to an alarming trend uh, that uh, LGBTQ people uh, from the United States are reaching out to us for assistance. And they're doing it in two aspects. One, uh, they are asylum seekers who are reaching out for assistance, but also U.S. born citizens who are saying that they are facing danger and are looking for assistance to uh, flee the state um, or relocate to another uh, another state or or another country, uh, which is alarming. Um, but I will say that there's a direct correlation between uh, those requests for help uh, and uh, U.S. policy across the country. Uh, one of the things our data does is uh, look at spikes throughout the year, and we saw two interesting spikes. Uh, one uh, was along the adoption of anti-LGBTQ, in particular anti-trans laws in various states. Um, like Florida. Uh, but the second, which was a, a little more surprising to us, was a, uh, after Roe v. Wade. Uh, and we, the spike then, I think, was uh, related to some concerns uh, that have since been uh, solved with the Protect for Marriage Act, that Roe v. Wade would open the door for less protections on LGBTQ5 plus persons. And so you see uh, our data points to general fear from people. Uh, and it continues to this year. The United States uh, in 2023 is amongst the top three countries of requests for help outside of Afghanistan and Uganda. So it's a deep concern for us. Uh, and we're looking carefully about how we work with other uh, partners across the country to address this phenomenon. So how do you sort out the idea that there are certain states inside this country where you're getting requests for assistance from, and at the same time, this country is also the place where you are trying to resettle some people from other parts of the world because the rights here are better than what they're fleeing? Yeah, to be clear, Rainbow Railroad is continuously uh, advocating with the Biden administration for increased resettlement to the United States. Um, and that is that continues to be our position. And at the same time, uh, we are monitoring and are concerned about um, the safety of LGBTQ plus people. You know, when we look at when we relocate people through international borders, what we're really looking for are whether they're general protections under the law uh, for LGBTQ plus persons, uh, and you know, are there refugee protections for those individuals? Uh, and the, and the, and our requests and our assistance in various countries ebb and flow. You know, w when uh, LGBTQ plus persons were facing detention um, uh, uh, under the so-called Muslim ban previously, for example, we we paused resettlement into the United States, uh, and so and we do that in multiple countries as well. Um, at the moment, you know, even though the state's laws are concerning, um, there are still overarching protections legally for LGBTQ plus in the United States. And, and ultimately, all of our interventions, whether it's directly in countries that criminalize same-sex intimacy or in the United States, are always driven by people and partners on the ground. So in this case, we, we listen really closely to our partners who, who are asylum seekers, who have sought asylum in the United States, and said, you know, and we're saying, and having the conversation, should we continue our efforts and work? And ultimately they say yes, because as people who've had the experience of fleeing their country, it's one thing to be concerned about laws in the States. It's another thing to be fleeing your country because it's life and death. And uh, the United States is still solace for many people. When you think about the big picture, is there any kind of a similarity between what might be happening in Florida and what might be happening in another part of the world? 
Absolutely. There are well-funded resource groups, uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, uh, religious groups here in the United States and other parts of the world that are funding these these uh, legislation. Sometimes they're copycat laws that are going from state to state and also from country to country. And so there's a blueprint, um, a playbook on uh uh, anti-LGBTQI plus and anti-trans laws that are being uh, passed around and, f and funded from country to country, which is driving the legislation. And we're also seeing that same movement happen over overseas. There is, it's not a coincidence that this is happening. So I'm looking at your report here in the top 10 countries of requests. Number one is Afghanistan. Is this a result of the Taliban taking over? Absolutely. Um, you know, it was very difficult to relocate people in Afghanistan uh, before the fall of the Taliban, uh, of, of Kabul and take over the Taliban. Uh, and there was a direct correlation with um, the withdrawal of U.S. and coalition forces, um, the takeover of the Taliban and the evacuation of people uh, that led to uh, the spike of requests for assistance. We released another report on Afghanistan. Um, you know, I have directly uh, been in neighboring Pakistan more than once to help set up our um, network. Um, you know, our organization was never, uh, never anticipated us being in the middle of geopolitical crises, but we're seeing direct, uh, Afghanistan was a real example of a larger geopolitical situation that directly impacted LGBTQ people at risk. And so we had to act and we have relocated several hundred people from Afghanistan. But with success of relocation comes an increase in requests for assistance, which is documented in the report. You were in Islamabad helping Afghans uh, leaving that country and coming into Pakistan. What was that like? This is another example of what it is for people to flee from one country of persecution to another neighboring country in order to seek protection. Um, you know, Pakistan also criminalizes same-sex intimacy, although there are some protections for trans individuals. Uh, and so the, 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 the trips were motivated by uh, building our partnership network. One of the challenges with, with Afghanistan is that civil society uh, organizations and people were fleeing the country. And so we need to set up as much neighboring networks as possible. And, and I'm really thankful for our partners on the ground who were mostly advocacy-based organizations, which completely transformed their offices into safe houses uh, while we built a more safe house system. Uh, you know, it's part of the job that we do to um, uh, help establish um, our partnership model in countries that sometimes aren't always safe. The other crisis that is getting a lot of airtime is the war in Ukraine, but often there are populations inside Ukraine, inside Russia that are not talked about as much. In your report, you talk about this crisis and what it's done. How has that war made things worse for the LGBTQ plus populations, I guess, on both sides of this war? Yeah, first in Ukraine, you know, the concern was ensuring that LGBTQ plus people had access to safe havens in neighboring countries. Uh, fortunately, with, um, with the conflict, their civil society organizations in neighboring countries really have stepped up to provide support. And we have worked to facilitate the, again, the establishment of safe houses uh, and resources so people fleeing Ukraine can get access to those resources. Uh, I think there remain challenges in particular for transgender women uh, who are facing difficulty leaving the country and of course the general instability of Ukraine. Uh, there were kind of, you know, incremental advances for LGBTQI plus persons in the country, but by far the country has not have overall protections of LGBTQI plus people. Uh, in Russia, the situation is a little, was a little more dire. We actually see, we actually saw more requests in Russia from people who were displaced. Um, but our work in Russia has been continuous since the 2013 anti-LGBT propaganda law, uh, and then subsequent, um, uh, republics like Chechnya, um, essentially torturing LGBTQ persons. And one of the things that we're concerned about is that while the focus is on Russia's aggression of Ukraine, uh, the fact of the matter is that the conflict affects LGBTQ people in Russia with limited uh, options for evacuation or resettlement. What are some of the stories that you have heard from these individuals that are either fleeing countries like Afghanistan or Uganda and are looking for a better life, whether it's in the United States or Europe or elsewhere? You know, uh, I, 
I have the kind of honor to kind of meet some of the people that we've helped uh, sometimes uh, on both sides of the journey. And, you know, actually just recently, I was in New York launching a report on World Refugee Day. And uh, in the room was uh, were three individuals that we helped. Uh, and one um, that really struck at me was someone that was from Kenya, actually, uh, who fled to Uganda, believe it or not, um, which also receives refugees. Uh, and so they were displaced in Kenya. They, fle they fled to Uganda uh, while awaiting our support. Uh, and then uh, with our support, um, we helped them relocate to the United States. Uh, you know, and they spoke about kind of what it was like to have to flee as a human rights defender because their house was literally burning down um, and what it meant for them to have safety and protection in the United States. I know you work on uh, advocacy issues and legislation. Have there been any successes for your organization and your cause in the climate of increasing anti-trans legislation in the United States? Our advocacy in the United States is guided by a memorandum by the president on the human rights of LGBTQI plus people around the world. And that memorandum stated two important things. One, around enhancing the U.S. role in enhancing human rights around the world, which we believe means that you also have to... Uh, you know, walk the talk by making sure that we're enhancing human rights in the country. Uh, and then the second one is protection for LGBTQI plus refugees. Uh, and one real opportunity that we're following right now, which is an advancement, um, is the establishment of a private sponsor program that will allow citizens across the country to work with Rainbow Railroad to provide support for LGBTQI plus refugees. If you had a message for someone who is uh, being discriminated against in their country and are looking for a way out. What is that? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, you know, do what you need to do to be safe. I think it's the first message that we provide with people that reach out to us, uh, sometimes facing real imminent danger. Um, and, you know, know that there, you, there are people uh, in solidarity with you uh, in your country, um, and organizations like Rainbow Railroad who are trying to do everything that we can for help. And I would also extend that same message to governments. You know, uh, we reached a historic milestone with the government of Canada, who is partnering with Rainbow Railroad through a direct trusted referral. Um, and we want to do that in the United States and other countries as well. Because ultimately what we really want to tell to that person listening is that we have options for you, uh, but we can't have options unless governments are stepping up to address the scale of the crisis. Kamali Powell, the CEO of the Rainbow Railroad. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.